why and how to learn English and Chinese using your free time, seven tips for the busy professional. I know that there are many methods and tips on how to learn English and Chinese. And it is true that if you have enough time for learning Chinese and English, it won't be difficult to learn it. But most of the professionals are too busy to study English and Chinese. Like most of striving professionals, I did not have enough time to learn English and Chinese. So my time for learning them had to be squeezed into the schedule. So I'd like to share my experience with you. And first, number one, you need a strong motivation. My scientific paper on transcultural embryization of pseudo traumatic pseudo aneurysms was accepted by RSNA in 1989. I was very happy because the acceptance rate of abstract by RSNA was just 35%. I was so happy, but I didn't know what to do because that was my first time. So I decided to meet Dr. Taiwan Lim, who worked for as a medical center and presented two scientific papers at RSNA 1988. So I took an express bus for three hours from my alma mater university to as a medical center because I worked for Jumbung National University at the time. Dr. Lim was kind enough to show me how to design the stents slide and how to organize the time for English presentation. After that, I stayed with Dr. Konstantin Kov at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia for one month, just before RSNA conference. I asked Dr. Kov to revise my English script and to record it in his voice. I listened to the tape over and over again until it was disconnected. And also I observed the animal studies because I wanted to learn how to do experimental study. And on Thanksgiving, Dr. Cope invited me to his house with two other guests. And he cooked turkey because that was Thanksgiving. When we started eating, Dr. Kopp suddenly asked me, do you eat turkey in Korea? I replied, I don't think so, but I saw one at the zoo. Not zoo, zoo. And that, what is zoo? How do you spell it? I replied, jet o o. What is jet? Please write down on this paper. I wrote down, he pronounced, oh, zoo. Uh, my face turned red. I really wanted the ground to open up and swallowed me. I was so embarrassed. And another mispronunciation, uh, one rabbit died of bleeding. But Dr. Kopp asked me the worst cause of death. I said he died of breathing, not bleeding. And also I had Dr. Kopp misunderstood me on and on. And I ended up crying on my way back to my boarding house from the University of Pennsylvania. It took me 15 minutes from the University of Pennsylvania to subway station and 10 minutes from subway station to my boarding house in subway. I still remember how sad I was. So I cried 
my eyes out because I was so sad. It was a strong motivation for me. After returning to Korea, I borrowed an English textbook from my nephew. It was not that difficult. And I read it from cover to cover, making notes of new grammar structures and idioms and phrases into my note. And I made a study schedule to learn English and stick to it. I set aside about an equal amount of time each day for the study until it became my habit. In, nine, in um, January 1992, I set up a small English study group consisting of five to six professors and invited native speakers to a hospital for one hour before our regular job. And then um, it has been my habit to take note whenever I came across useful English expressions at English classes at, at international conferences like this. And then I asked my English teachers whether my notes were correct or not. After that, I saved into my notebook. I moved to Asa Medical Center in 1993. So I continued learning English in Asa Medical Center. But it was really difficult for me to invite native speakers to Asa Medical Center at early time in the morning. So I decided to meet the vice president of the hospital to explain about the importance of English for uh, as a medical center's professor for the future. He accepted my request and planned AMC conducting 10 English classes for professors and residents in 1999. Those uh, classes are still going on. So and this is uh, my English class one month before my retirement. You can see six people and the English teacher. Number four, pay attention to any unfamiliar sound. Probably you remember this slide. I used this one before. Every time I present the scientific papers or gave lectures in English, I added new vocabulary to my pronunciation notebook, uh, starting from ladies and gentlemen. As you know, Mr. Eugene Che, a 30-year student from Cornell University, stayed with me for one year to learn how to write a paper in English. That was a good opportunity for me. So I asked him to teach our team members for 30 minutes during lunch time. Also, I asked him to record my English notebook in his voice. He made it. So interestingly, I have given a total of 321 lectures and 464 presentations in English for the past 30 years. But there was only 25 pages regarding the uh, pronunciation. In another words, the numbers of English vocabulary for a doctor to use in his academic life are limited to a certain boundary. Number five, review the notebook until it becomes a habit. I have dedicated my free time to review the notebook. For example, it was a perfect time for me to review it when it went abroad for lectures in the airport and on airplane. I usually we have to wait in the airport for two hours. And also when we fly to the United States, it took 10 hours or 13 hours. It was a perfect time for me to review the notebook from cover to cover. 
Also, I wrote some important phrases and idioms on a piece of paper and carried it in my pocket to read it when I had free time. In hospital, it was not possible to take my notebook because it was thick. That's why I used the paper. In retrospect, I have had three plateaus with my English. First plateau with presentation and the writing paper in English. Second plateau with English at parties and speeches for public speaking. Third plateau with award acceptance speech and lectures on my life story. Regarding the presentation and writing manuscript as my first challenge, my wife and I were on a year, one year sabbatical leave starting from September 2004. We stayed in Cáceres in Spain for three months for collaboration. I stayed in veterinarian doctor's hospital. I taught them how to place the prosthetic stents. And also they taught me how to use endoscopic examination after prosthetic stent placement. And also I visited many universities in Spain and in Germany and Italy and Rome and Switzerland and France and South of America, uh, South Africa for giving lectures. Mm -hmm. And again, Germany and uh, Portugal. And then we moved our base camp to New Orleans in the state for four months, visiting many universities in the United States and also the UK and also uh, Canada. So I stayed at Louisiana State University in New Orleans. That was our base camp, but we visited so many universities. And then uh, when we visited Colombia and Peru for lectures for two months without home base because they didn't supply us the guest house. And then uh, we stayed in Osaka City University in Japan to visit many universities in Japan and China. In a year, I gave a total of 10, uh, 104 lectures. Also, I had a free plenty of time to review my English notebook and my English uh, pronunciation notebook. After that, presentation in English became far less stressful for me compared to before my sabbatical leave, I would rather enjoy giving lectures in English. And also during my sabbatical leave, I was able to spend the precious time with plenty of my mentors. Uh, for example, we stay from time to time, we stayed at my mentor's house and we were able to recharge our batteries without which put us back on our track. That was also the best chance to build a friendship. Uh, for example, this is Dr. Kompi from the University of Colorado Health Science Center in Denver. He invited me to his hospital for 10 days and they asked me to give seven lectures on, uh, for two days. And uh, he took a vacation for seven days. Of course, he didn't allow us to stay in a, a hotel. They urged us to stay in his house. And then uh, he showed us around the head, their second house in a remote area. 
And also we stayed in Valesky Resort, which is one of the best in the United States. So uh, I really enjoyed uh, skiing and also the at night, it was wonderful to see the stars and also the moon. Regarding the re English at parties and speeches for public speaking at my second challenge, I set up the Society of Gastrointestinal Intervention. I invited Dr. Hotong to this society twice and Dr. Mariano Jimenez five times. And then together with uh, some enthusiastic Korean interventional radiologist and uh, gastrointestinal physicians. And we decided to invite renowned scholars, including Dr. Andy Adam from the UK is a radiologist and Dr. Kozalek from Seattle in the United States is a gastroenterologist, and Dr. Ted Baron from Mayo Clinic, and Dr. Zip Haskell as an interventional radiologist in Virginia University. And uh, for help in this endeavor in taking chairmanship and the formulating guidelines and the setting up committees, they accepted our honest request and helped us beyond our expectation. And then, thanks to them, the SGI is a kind of world-class level regarding the English and also quality. Since then, I have forged a strong scientific and personal bond with them. They have always inspired me to pursue my dreams by continuously encouraging my challenge and passion to stand on. Regarding the accept, acceptance, award acceptance speech and the lectures on my life as my third challenge, as you know, I needed to learn English vocabulary describing my philosophy, ideology, economics, and art. Let alone, let alone in medical English. I asked my mentors and friends to revise it and record it in their voice again. For example, uh, this is Dr. Compio again. I asked him to revise my speech for gold medal award at SIR 2016. And he recorded in his voice. This is uh, Dr. Zip Haskell. He recorded and revised my script for uh, lecture, 30 years of intervention from the mind to the global stent market. You know this one? This is one of the popular lecture in the world. And thanks to Dr. Zip Haskell, was, I was able to improve my English. Number six, start learning Chinese when you reach a plateau with your English. Why? Uh, because I uh, had the second sabbatical leave starting from 2013 March, and I stayed in China for six months. So I Really, it was difficult to make a decision for staying in China for six months because my sabbatical leave was really precious. So I didn't know whether it was a good idea to stay in China for six months. So first I stayed in China for three months, but I found out that my decision was correct. So I canceled visiting the United States States for three months and then visited China again. I'll explain why. Because you'd better to start learning Chinese when you are young because of the three reasons. First, 
China will be a major medical power when you reach my age. Second, China has incredible manpower. And I believe that China is the land of opportunity. Uh, here you can see the circles on the map of China are the places I visited for lectures for during my second sabbatical leave. I'll explain the evidence base with the use of my mentoring and honorarium. Uh, from 1997, I have mentored many Chinese doctors. I'd like to classify my men mentees into three uh, groups from first generation from 1999 to 2007, second generation from 2008 to 2013, third generation from 2014. Uh, regarding the first generation, when I recruited them, I interviewed whether their English communication was good enough because I really wanted them to communicate with my team members. Regarding the second generation, I interviewed papers in Chinese and English communication. Regarding the third generation, SCI index papers and grant proposal. So the third generations, they are much better than Korean generations. They are much better than American generations. I found out that. Another reason, regarding the honorarium, when I visited China for lectures during the first generation era, they didn't give me any honorarium. They just supported me accommodation. Regarding the second generation era, the level of honorarium was same as the level of Korea. Regarding the third generation, the level of Japan. You know that Japan is the highest level of honorarium. Even 30 years ago, when I give a lecture in Japan, they paid me thousand US dollars, even now, thousand US dollars for one hour. But in China, in some places, they are over the level of Japan. Also, I started learning Chinese in 2005 because their English was not good enough for me to communicate. So I decided to learn Chinese. So even though I started in 2005, thanks to my Chinese mentees, I, my Chinese was becoming better and better. And then from the second generation, I didn't use English between them, but also uh, at the meeting, I used English and they used English, but between and my mentees and me, I just used the Chinese. So thanks to my Chinese mentees, I was able to challenge myself to learn one of the most difficult languages. The number seven, find the mentors to keep in touch with them. I believe that this is the best method to stay motivated. As I mentioned before, I have 18 mentors, 21 mentors overall, but 18 mentors regarding the learning foreign languages. And here you can see Americans, and also uh, this is uh, Japanese and Chinese. This is my wife also. My wife is English professor. She is my mentor. So throughout the struggling time with the learning foreign languages, I was able to build up strong mentorship with many people in my academic life. So the discussions with my mentors have been constant sources of my motivation. 